I welcome you all to the lecture number 19 of the course title uh, Psychology of Emotions, Theory and Applications. So, we are in the module number 8 and in the module 8 we are discussing about emotion based disorders. So, this module has two lectures, the lecture number 18 was about the depression and today we will be talking about anxiety disorders. So, these are two uh, disorders most commonly found in terms of prevalence rate and uh, at the core of this emo uh, of these uh, psychological disorders are emotions. So, today we will be talking about anxiety disorders. So, just give you a brief recap of what we have discussed in the last lecture. We have discussed uh, the whole idea of depression as a disorder and more uh, specifically we have discussed the various symptoms of major depression and uh, we try to understand how this depression uh, how these different symptoms could manifest in different types of extreme ends for example too much of sleep or too little sleep and so on and what could be the reasons behind those extreme symptoms uh, we have also discussed that there could be uh, there are different ways uh, people have tried to cat categorize depression uh, including uh, categories such as typical depression, atypical depression, uh, also the DSM-5 there is also categories of major depression uh, and persistent depressive disorder and so on. So, we have tried to understand all these categories and their symptoms and how they are different from each other. We have also discussed uh, the possible causes of depression uh, including genetic causes as well as past experiences of life. Uh, we have also discussed various cognitive aspects of depression in terms of understanding how what what goes on at the thought level when a person experiences depression, uh, including uh, how thoughts become more irrational, how explanatory style changes in terms of become becoming more pessimistic style of explanation. The concept of learned helplessness could also be very much applicable uh, and most of the cases of depression could be associated with learned helplessness. Uh, we have also discussed that rumination is another concept that is, uh, that is thought processes that could involve with uh, the depression as a disorder. So, all these things we have discussed and how they are kind of at the foundation of depression in terms of um, manifesting different symptoms. Uh, at the end we have discussed the various treatment available for depression uh, including cognitive therapies and uh, uh, you know certain psychoactive drug uh, certain uh, pharmaceutical drugs and so on and all these possible and some of the extreme uh, treatment options that are also available. So, all these things we have discussed in the last class. Today, we will be talking about anxiety disorder as a as a cluster of disorder and we will try to understand what are the different uh, categories of disorders uh, we can kind of include it under anxiety disorders. So, we will be typically talking about anxiety disorders and various types of it. We will be also discussing causes of anxiety disorders and at the end we will be uh, discussing treatment of anxiety disorders. So, when we talk about anxiety disorders, so it is a cluster of disorders. So, there could be multiple disorders under this cluster and anxiety is a very commonly experienced uh, emotional aspects that we all experience in our day to day life. Uh, it is very common that we feel anxious or nervous before important things or events in our life such as before a test or before a meeting, before a presentation and so on. So, it is a very common experiences. Now, those are the kind of experiences that are associated with experiences of anxiety. Now, when we talk something as a disorder, obviously, uh, the intensity and uh, its impact is much more uh, extreme. In that sense, when we call something as anxiety disorders, we are not talking about those common experiences of anxiety. We are talking about excessive and pathological, sorry. So, when we talk about anxiety disorders, we are basically referring to excessive and pathological levels of fear and anxiety. Uh, which uh, became very much popular in the psychiatry in the 19th century during Sigmund Freud's time. Uh, so, something becomes disorder only when it becomes excessive and extreme and it kind of impacts your life adversely in terms of functioning level. So, sometimes we experience common and symptoms of anxiety, but uh, this is a kind of everyday experience, but it can become disorder only when it becomes excessive and pathological level. Now, it is normal that we experience anxiety in different uh, situations of our life uh, where there are uncertainties. Uh, chronic and intense anxiety without a visible cause is considered abnormal. So, when your anxiety becomes very chronic without any real causes behind it. So, that is very important keyword that we need to understand. A uh, lot of evidences actually suggest that individual with anxiety disorder may be overly sensitive to threat cues. So, people especially with the anxiety disorders or more prone to anxiety disorders are very sensitive to 
threats. So, any kind of threats or any kind of uncertainties or any kind of apprehensions, they becomes highly uh, you know uh, sensitive to those cues and their reaction patterns becomes overwhelming. And they exhibit heightened vigilance and readiness to attend to potential threats. So, this is something very important. Uh, so, there could be individual uh, vulnerability in terms of uh, why some people develop this disorder in the first place. Now, if you look at the prevalence of anxiety disorder, uh, this is uh, in terms of prevalence, there are uh, certain statistics available. So, generally uh, some of the data shows that about 4 percent of the global population has an anxiety disorder, which could translate into a large number like 301 million people in the world. So, this is a huge chunk of population could be experiencing anxiety disorder. The number of persons affected has increased by more than 55 percent from 1990 to 2019. Some of the data shows that so the, the rate or prevalence rate of anxiety disorder is actually increasing with the passage of time. Uh, and this rate of increase seems to be quite uh, dramatic and quite high in terms of if you see last few decades. Some of the earlier other studies also reported uh, some statistics in terms of current prevalence uh, in uh, somewhere in uh, 2013 uh, across 44 countries range between 0 0.9 to 28.3 percent de depending on the different countries this uh, prevalence rate kind of the, the, the range actually included from 0 0.9 to 28.3 percent with the global prevalence calculated to be 7.3 percent. So, this is kind of little earlier statistics which also shows the prevalence rate could be quite high. In 2017, uh, 197.3 million people had mental disorders in India. So, this is in the context of India. Some statistics shows that uh, about in, 19, uh, in 2017, about 197.3 million people had some kind of mental disorders, uh, which included 45.7 million people with depressive disorders and uh, remaining 44 point, uh, and 44.9 uh, million with anxiety disorders. So, if you see uh, the prevalence rate of uh, depression depression and the anxiety dis disorder, they are quite neck to neck in terms of prevalence rates. The number is quite similar. Indicating depressive disorders contributed to the most of the total mental disorders followed by anxiety disorders. So, this is kind of in the context of Indian setting also, the prevalence rate could be almost at par with the global, uh, global percentages. Now, when we talk about anxiety, obviously, there are few other terms which sign kind of people get confused or they mixed up or people kind of sometimes synonymously use these terms, but uh, there could be subtle or some technical differences between these terms. So, one term is anxiety, another is fear and stress. Many times people kind of mix these terms together. So, it is kind of uh, important before we talk about disorder in detail, uh, the technical difference between these three terms. So, these are kind of very related emotions and sometimes people experience them together also sometimes, so, but they have some distinct differences. So, when we talk about anxiety, it refers to a state of uneasiness or worry about the future uncertainties or potential threats. Anxiety is mostly related to you know some kind of future uncertainties or some kind of apprehension about what something is wh 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 about something that is going to happen in the future. So, some potential threat you are expecting or some kind of uncertainty you are expe expecting from the f in, in the near future. So, in response to that or kind of the, the emotional experiences that we experience is called as anxiety and it is always associated with symptoms like uneasiness and sense of worry and so on. So, it could be associated with various uh, physical symptoms such as sweating, palpitations, muscle tensions etcetera. Uh, it is a natural and normal response to stressful events of life, but when it is it becomes excessive, it can lead to disorder state. Uh, so, mostly the anxiety word is used in the context of apprehensions about some potential threats, mostly in the context of near future or something that is going to happen in the future, some sense of worry about those kind of uh, possible things that are going to happen. Now, fear is uh, another term uh, where you know many time it could be mixed with anxiety also. Uh, it is a natural emotion that arises in response to immediate or present danger. Mostly fear is uh, fear arises mostly in the present context when you see something is dangerous in your environment. So, in response to those uh, situations or whatever 
the stimulus that is present, uh, if they are perceived as dangerous, that could be experienced as a in, in the emotional term, it is fear. So, it arises in response to an immediate or present danger, uh, whatever we are experiencing in the present context. So, mostly fear is in the present context. So, it is characterized by fight or flight response, which we have already discussed, I think, in the uh, physiological aspects of emotion when we, we have discussed in the uh, uh, few in the modules where we have discussed physiological aspects. So, so it uh, mostly whenever we perceive something as dangerous, there could be fight or flight response where you may try to fight with the situation or may run away depending on whatever is appropriate as per your thought processes. So, this is a physiological response to perceive threat, fear is usually adaptive fear could be adaptive in a sense, it helps you to protect yourself whenever there is a danger in the environment. So, that is what, uh, so most of the time fear could be adaptive and it help us to survive uh, and take actions appropriately in a situation where there is a perception of threat or danger. So, mostly fear happens in the present context. Stress is, uh, is a term that is generally, it is a response of the body mind. Uh, to physical or emotional demands or pressures from the life, uh, whether they are real pressures or you perceive something as uh, demands or challenging situations, uh, whatever that is perceived, it may not be real also. So, so it is mostly the stress is an interpretation process, where you kind of interpret a situation as more than your ability to handle. The moment you interpret a situation that you will not be able to handle or your resources are not good enough to handle a situation, the natural outcome or the emotional experiences that we have is stress. So, it, it is way the body responds, the mind responds to a situation which is perceived as more than your resources can handle the situation. The moment you think I will not be able to handle a situation, that is a natural response the body and mind does that is called stress. You know, so some kind of demand, some kind of pressure from the environment, which is perceived as uh, possibly that uh, there could be challenges in terms of coping with the situation. So, the resultant experience is a stress. Stress could be positive also, it could be negative also, depending on uh, how the context or the situation. Uh, some stress could be positive in a sense, it could stimulate you, motivate you to do things which probably you will not do. So, the, if there is a stress, you will be, you will be more likely to do that task simply because there is a motivation, there is a situation that is propelling you to do something. So, a lot of these challenging situations are associated with stress, but this could be positive. A lot of stress could be negative. In fact, uh, if particularly the stress is very chronic or very intense and if it remains for a long time, it could have a very adverse impact on your body mind system. It could contribute to psychological disorders, it could contribute to physical disorders and so on, particularly diseases like heart diseases and so on could be highly connected to stressful experiences. So, in summary, anxiety is a state of uh, uneasiness or worry about future uncertainties. Fear is response to immediate danger, immediate in the present situation mostly and stress is generally response to physical or emotional demands, more specifically when you perceive that situation is more than your resources can handle, that is the stress. So, they are all related, many times they are all mixed up in the real life situation, in certain situation can evoke fear, anxiety also and stress also at the same time. Sometimes they are experienced separately also. So, while they are related, they have distinct differences uh, which are important in order to understand the managing this emotional effectively. Uh, so, it is important to understand the difference between this term because generally people mixed these terms together and use synonymously. So, when we talk about anxiety disorders, so it is a category of its disorders uh, which uh, has many, many specific disorders under this term. So, it is not just one disorder, so there will be multiple anxiety disorders which could be kind of collectively called as an anxiety disorders. So, the recent DSM-5 which means Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder, the, re, the most recent one is uh, the fifth version. According to this uh, DSM-5, uh, the disorders which could be categorized under anxiety disorders include generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, agoraphobia, specific phobia, social anxiety disorder separation anxiety disorder and selective mutism. 
these are the disorders which are kind of considered under anxiety disorders. So, we will be looking at each of them very briefly and try to understand how they are related to anxiety and uh, what are the symptoms of each of these. Now, before this the DSM-4 the earlier version had uh, there are some differences made in the recent one from the earlier version uh, made some significant changes in the anxiety disorders lot of changes have been made. In DSM-4 the earlier version of the manual of mental disorder OCD obsessive compulsive disorder was also included under anxiety disorder post traumatic stress disorder was also included under this one uh, the anxiety disorders acute stress disorders were also classified as anxiety disorders. So, earlier this uh, OCD, PTSD and acute stress disorder were considered under anxiety disorder. Now, in the DSM-5 OCD and related disorders are grouped separately. So, OCD obsessive compulsive disorder is now a separate category, it is no longer under anxiety disorder and uh, PTSD and acute states are also separated and classified separately under a new category called trauma and stressor related disorders. So, a separate category was introduced to include PTSD and acute stress disorders. So, they are now considered under trauma and stressor related disorders. OCD is also separated. Now, these uh, are not uh, classified under anxiety disorders. At present in the DSM-5 and the anxiety disorder included the categories that we have listed earlier. DSM-5 also introduced some new anxiety diagnosis which were earlier not there like separation anxiety disorder was not there, selective mutism was also not there and there is an another category other specified and unspecified and the anxiety disorder was also included under DSM-5. So, these are new inclusions under this category. This new category of last one that is other specified and unspecified anxiety disorders actually includes uh, condition that do not come under any of the other categories which cannot be kind of uh, put into any of the other categories uh, which uh, do not meet the full diagnosis criteria for any of the other anxiety disorder. So, they can, could be kind of uh, categorized under this, but still cause significant distress or impairment in daily functioning. Then some condition could be considered under this. So, this is uh, like if something is not explainable by any other categories, it could be put into this uh, the last category. So, these are new in inclusions under uh, DSM-5. So, let us see the, the DSM-5 categories of anxiety disorders or each of them we will briefly look into them, what are the symptoms of this one. So, one, uh, e one particular uh, anxiety disorder which is called as generalized anxiety disorder is something that is uh, characterized by excessive and uncontrollable worry about everyday things such as work, health, family and finances. So, it is a very generalized anxiety disorders. There is no specific reason or a specific uh, cause or specific target object for which you are anxious. It is a very generalized kind of thing. You are kind of anxious about most of the things of your life. So, you have a sense of uncontrollable worry, constant worry uh, about almost everyday things like work, about health, about family, finances, it is a general, almost everything becomes a uh, matter of anxiety. So, that is called anxiety disorder. Most of this worry are unrealistic, it is very understandable, you cannot, everything cannot go wrong in your life, if you are kind of anxious about almost everything, that means most of these things will be unrealistic and out of proportion to the situation and these things should last at least for 6 months then only it can be kind of categorized under disorder category. So, if at least 6 month people are kind of in this state where they are kind of unrealistically worrying about most of the things of their life, then it could indicate that you know the person may be under uh, or experiencing generalized anxiety disorder. Other symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder may include restlessness, fatigue, difficulty con in concentration irritability, muscle tension, sleep disturbances and so on. These are some of the additional symptoms that one can experience in the generalized anxiety disorder. And this is something very commonly, it is true for all, all disorder, the symptom must cause significant impairment in daily functioning. We can call something as a disorder only when it impacts your life adversely. You are not able to function properly because of the effect of this uh, emotional state. So, you are not able to function in your professional life, in your personal life and so on, everything is disturbed. Then only it becomes a disorder, otherwise 
if you are just experiencing some symptoms, anxiety symptoms, but it is you are able to function properly, then it may not be considered as a disorder. The next category of under anxiety disorder comes is panic disorder. So, this is something uh, also uh, very specific uh, category that is listed under uh, DSM-5 and the criteria in DSM-5 is like number one is recurrent unexpected panic attacks. So, one of the thing that happens under panic disorder is that people experiences unexpected panic attacks and which could be recurrent. So, multiple instances of panic attacks could happen, okay? recurrent, it could be one after the other with certain interval of time or maybe consequently uh, and people may not be expecting, they may not even predict when something is suddenly something can stimulate panic attack. So, panic attack is a sudden and intense surge of fear or discomfort that peaks within a minute and includes at least four of the following symptoms. So, what happens in panic attack is that it is very sudden, suddenly it will kind of get stimulated by something with an intense surge of fear and discomfort that peaks within minutes. Suddenly you become uncontrollable fear and discomfort may arise in your system, in your mind body system and it suddenly become at the peak of it, very intense and uh, it could include lot of symptoms, at least four of following symptoms should be there. It could include whenever you are under the state of panic attack, you can experience palpitations, pounding heart or accelerated heart rate. So, your heart rate will become very fast because of the intense fear. You can start sweating very profusely, there could be trembling or shaking in the body, sensation of shortness of breath or smoothering. So, the suffocation, feeling of suffocation, not able to take breath this could be also associated in the panic attack at least four of these should be there not necessarily all the all that we are discussing here then feeling of choking chest pain or discomfort nausea or abdominal distress feeling of dizziness unsteady light headed or fainting or about to fall faint those kind of experiences could be there derealization means feeling of unreality or depersonalization or being detached from oneself or you may feel like you are completely detached or suddenly you are not able to control your body. So, body is somewhere else, you are somewhere else. So, depersonalization, such kind of temporary state could arise. Fear of losing control or going crazy, fear of dying, all these symptoms could be experienced under panic attack. No? Not necessarily every all this will be experienced, but at least four of these will be there should be there to consider something as a panic attack. So, this is the one first criteria. Second is at least one of the attacks has been followed by one month or more of one of the following. So, at least one of these attacks, so there could be multiple attacks, but one of these attacks should be followed by one month means after the attack at least for one month people may experience some of the other aspects like persistent concerns or worry about additional panic attacks. So, whenever you have been one attack, so you are persistently again worried I may have another attack. So, there is a persistent concern and worry about additional panic attacks and what will happen if such an attack happens. So, there is a consistent worry about that, that I may lose control, may have a heart attack or I may go crazy and so on. So, this could be consistently in your mind, I may get another attack, I may get another attack and I may lose control, I may go crazy and all kinds of things. So, could be associated after the panic attack or there could be a significant maladaptive change in behavior related to the attacks like you avoid exercise or unfamiliar situations, the person may start stop going to situations in life, different situations of life with the fear that him, he or she may get another panic attack. So, the person may avoid doing exercise or going to some new places and so on simply because of fear of getting another attack. So, that could be also another thing. Uh, after a attack person may have this kind of symptoms at least for one month. The third aspect of panic attack is that the panic attacks are not attributable to the physiological effects of substance or any other medical condition. Now, those, this this should not be stimulated by some taking taking some medicines and other things. So, if it is an effect of some other medicine, we cannot call it as a panic attack. Panic attack should happen without the impact of any other substances. So, that is something very important. And the panic attacks are better accounted by other uh, are not better accounted by 
another mental disorder such as so there should not be a, this act, this attack should not be because of some other mental disorders you know it should should not be better accounted so it should not be because of some other kind of anxiety disorder panic attack is there then we cannot call it as a panic attack if it, it can be explained by some uh, better explained by some other disorder so it should not be better explained by other mental disorder so it could be associated with some other mental disorder sometimes panic attack could be associated with some other mental disorder but the panic attack itself should be explained by the panic attack itself not by the other mental disorders so generally um, uh, professional mental health professional could kind of diagnose this and treat panic uh, panic attacks so treatment part we will be talking little later some possible options that are available so this is about panic attacks so these are some of the symptoms uh, which generally um, mental health professionals takes into account to diagnose somebody as a whether they have panic attack or not another disorder that is considered under anxiety disorder is agoraphobia so agoraphobia is listed as a separate diagnosis in dsm 5 but generally it is often comes with panic disorder generally people with panic disorder may also experience agoraphobia generally they may come together but they that agoraphobia itself is a different uh, disorder and listed separate disorder in the dsm-5 but many time it could be associated with the panic disorder itself so the what are the diagnostic criteria of D, uh, agoraphobia it includes mark fear or anxiety about two or more of the following situations so generally it is the fear of certain situations in life which includes like using public transportation such as buses trains and planes so there is a very strong fear when the person uses public transportations or buses trains and planes where there are other people in the situations uh, being in the open spaces such as parking lots marketplaces bridges and so on so generally it is stimulated by certain situations situations like this are generally co could stimulate anxiety so th which is called as an agoraphobia it may also also being uh, stimulated by uh, being in enclosed spaces such as shops theater cinema halls it could also be stimulated by standing in line or being in a crowd or being outside of the home alone sometimes could be stimulated by that so generally individual whenever because they are kind of experience anxiety because of whenever they are in, the, in this kind of situations they generally avoid using or going to this kind of places or experience intense fear or anxiety when exposed to these situations okay naturally the the person will try to avoid but many time if they cannot avoid they need to go to these places and uh, these places generally stimulates intense anxiety so that this this is this situation is called as agoraphobia now generally the fear or anxiety is out of proportion to the actual danger posed by the situation and the social uh, and to the socio cultural context so generally obviously we call this disorder simply because it is out of proportion there is no objective reality to the situation that this will cause problem to that persons but this is kind of blown out of proportion generally or the person kind of experiences out of proportion as compared to the actual danger or there may not be any danger at all so the fear the anxiety or avoidance is persistent typically lasting for six months or more at least people if they experience for continuously six months this kind of fear then the probability of kind of diagnosing them as an agoraphobia increases uh, very much so this fear anxiety and avoidance causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social occupational and other areas of functioning so for every disorder already i said that functional impairment is very important so if this uh, all these fears kind of impairs your functioning in daily life so that should be another criteria to call it as a disorder so this fear anxiety and avoidance of this situation is is be, is not better explained by any other disorders if they are better explained by any other disorder obviously you, they will be categorized under that disorder this should not be explained by other disorder better explained then only we can call it as an agoraphobia so generally it is uh, as i said that most of these agoraphobia cases are often diagnosed along with panic disorder because many people in agoraphobia experience panic attacks in situation that trigger their fear and anxiety so mostly whenever the situation that we have listed whenever a person with agoraphobia encounters such situation they may attack they also 
the probability of experiencing panic attack is very high. So, generally the panic attack and this uh, disorder kind of goes hand in hand. So, people can properly uh, mental health uh, professionals can diagnose it and uh, treat it properly. So, this is the basically the diagnostic aspect of agoraphobia. The next one is called as an specific phobia which is also considered under anxiety disorder. So, DSM-5 characteristics of specific phobia include marked and persistent fear or anxiety about specific objects or situation. So, in the specific phobia means people are fearful about specific things specific things whenever they encounter it stimulates anxiety in their mind you know so people are there could be very specific things where uh, they stimulate very strong anxiety reactions and which could uh, impair their functional aspects and so on so examples could be people could be uh, have specific phobias about some animals some natural environment it could be some people are phobic about heights or thunderstorm and so on. Animals may include snake, it may include uh, spiders and so on. Some people may be phobic about blood, injection, injury and maybe some situations like uh, flying and close spaces and so on. So, people may be phobic about different situations in life, uh, but in specific phobia people are uh, they show this anxiety reaction only in reaction to those situations those objects uh, which are which that may be very specific for person to person. So, the fear or anxiety is excessive and unreasonable that is why we are calling it as a disorder given the actual danger posed by the object or the situation. The phobic object or the situation almost always provokes immediate fear or anxiety. So, whenever they see that situation if somebody is fearful of any object the moment they see that object it immediately provokes fear or anxiety. The phobic object or situation is ap actively avoided or endured with intense fear or anxiety. For example, if somebody uh, is uh, phobic about spider, the moment they see a spider it will immediately provoke fear and anxiety and the person will try to avoid and run away from that situation whenever they encounter uh, such objects. The fear or anxiety is persistently typically lasting for 6 months or more. At least people should experience such fear at least for 6 months or it could be more than that also to kind of consider it as a disorder. The fear or anxiety causes clinical significant distress and impairment which is common to all the disorders and it should not be better explained by any other mental disorders. So, it could be associated with some other mental disorder but it should not be better explained then it will be considered under that only. So, if any other medical condition remains obviously this fear or anxiety will be much more than what normally experienced. So, uh, it is very important to note that specific phobias can have a significant impact on an individual's quality of life uh, and can be treated with therapy, medication and combination of those things. So, obviously, most of this anxiety disorder can impact your quality of life because you will be certain situations and certain uh, objects and all this could limit your life experiences and they may stimulate so much of fear and anxiety that you will not be able to function properly. So, in that sense it could have a negative impact on the quality of your life. Another category that comes under anxiety disorder is called social anxiety disorder. So, the DSM-5 criteria for social anxiety disorder are the marked and persistent fear and anxiety about one or more social situation in which the individual is exposed to possible scrutiny by others. So, social anxiety disorder by the name it is very clear that people are here anxious about social situations situations where they are exposed to other people's scrutiny or where the other people can judge you or kind of uh, uh, possible scrutiny by other people in the social situation. So, that evokes anxiety. So, examples of social situation include public speaking, uh, meeting new people, eating or drinking in public. So, wherever there is a situation that other people are there and they may be evaluating you, scrutinizing you that evokes anxiety. So, that is called social anxiety disorder. The individual fears that they will act in a way or show anxiety symptoms that will be negatively evaluated by them. So, there is a constant fear how others will judge me, how others will evaluate me, I may do something wrong or something silly others, how others will perceive me. So, this is a constant worrying factor that goes on in the mind of uh, people with social anxiety. So, that is why they are kind of uh, become highly anxious in the social situations. So, social situation almost always provoke fear and anxiety. 
any social situation they will be uncomfortable so that's the thing because it evokes anxiety social situations are avoided or endured with intense fear or anxiety so people try to avoid social situations uh, which could uh, very strongly impact their quality of life because uh, we are social animals we cannot avoid social situations and avoidance of social situation in many times could you know be impact your life very negatively because you need to deal with people in order to for the progression of your own life as well as or your personal as well as professional life so it's an important aspect of every human life uh, but people with social anxiety disorder they highly uh, their life is constrained by this fear so this fear or anxiety should be persistent and lasting at least for 6 month and more so that's the criteria fear or anxiety causes clinically significant distress or impairment in different aspect of one's life so that is there with, with every disorder and it should not be better explained by any other mental disorders if any other med medical condition is present fear and anxiety or avoidance could be more it could be excessive because it is kind of added by other medical condition so it is very important that social uh, anxiety disorder can have a significant Im impact on our quality of life as we have already seen and uh, this could be treated with proper uh, pro uh, mental health professionals can do diagnosis and uh, proper treatment of such disorders so there is uh, something called a separation anxiety disorder which was also kind of um, the newly added in the dsm 5 uh, a category uh, which could also be mostly uh, seen in children so this is called as an um, the criteria or the uh, diagnostic features of separation anxiety disorder are first is it's a developmentally inappropriate and excessive fear or anxiety connect con, uh, concerning separation from those whom the individual is attached so it's a, it becomes developmentally inappropriate and excessive uh, you know fear and anxiety connected with separation from some the important figures in one's life like it could be father mother and whatever it is some attachment figures would be there so as a child whenever a child gets born obviously the child is attached to mother mother and to some extent father or immediate family members so the attachment figure would be mother now let's say it is appropriate for a newborn child to be attached to mother or for certain years certain number of years but it will be inappropriate if the child is not able to separate from the mother and do other th task or need to go somewhere else so it becomes in the case of separation anxiety disorder it becomes a developmentally inappropriate means in this stage of development one should not be so attached or it should one should be comfortable in kind of moving away and doing the task so when the person is not able to do that it becomes kind of uh, disorder in that sense so it's a developmentally inappropriate and excessive fear or anxiety concerning separation from those to whom the individual is attached as evidenced by three or more of the following so this excessive attachment could be expressed or manifest itself into different ways some of these ways are like this so there could be recurrent excessive distress when anticipating or experiencing separation from whom or from major attachment figures so the moment the person even anticipates that he he or she needs to go away from the attachment figure it could be mother father whatever it is or from the home the person experiences you know kind of excessive distress or anxiety it could be when they are really moving away or it could be just perception that i need to move away so that is called uh, that could be one of the symptom the person could persistence or excessive worry about losing or about possible harm befalling major attachment figure so person has a consistent fear or worry about that he or she may lose or there may be something harm befalling on them or attach or particularly the major attachment figure with whom they are attached so that kind of uh, could be exaggerated thought processes could be also be there which could be associated with excessive fear fear of losing them there could be persistent or excessive worry that the untoward event will lead to the separation from a major attachment figure example getting lost or kidnapped so that could be also another thought that the, the if they kind of get separated they may be lost or kidnapped by somebody or something like this so those kind of exaggerated fear could be uh, associated with separation anxiety disorders 
there could be persistent reluctance or refusal to go to school or work or elsewhere because of separation fears. So, such kids particularly who are experiencing the separation anxiety disorder could find it difficult to go to school because they need to move away from the attachment figure. So, that could be a uh, problematic aspect in that sense or going to or playing with the other kids and so on. So, those kind of issues could be there. So, persistent reluctance or refusal to be alone or without major attachment figures at home or in other settings. So, that could also be the person could be the consistently refused to be alone or without major attachment figure. The person always wants to be associated with the attachment figure. There could be persistent excessive fear of or reluctance about being alone or without the major attachment figure at home. So, basically it is the same I think point is repeated here. So, these are some of the uh, possible manifestation of symptoms of separation anxiety. Some of uh, at least three of them, three or more could be present to an in individual who is experiencing this separation anxiety disorder. There could be uh, other important symptoms like refusal to go to sleep without being near to the ma major attachment figures, repeated nightmares involving the theme of separation, repeated complaints of physical symptoms when separation from major attachment figures occur or is anticipated. So, physically there could be manifestation of symptoms in terms of physical illnesses and so on could be ex also experienced by the people. Second important aspect of separation anxiety is that you know the, this fear anxiety or avoidance is persistent lasting for at least 4 weeks in children. If it is if it remains for more at least for 4 weeks uh, for children and adolescent and in case of adults if it is more than 6 months then it becomes a possible case for you know diagnosis of uh, separation anxiety disorder. It happens mostly in the children, but some cases of adult case could also be there. The disturbances causes obviously clinically significant distress and impairment in social, academic, occupational other important areas of function. Uh, the disturbance is not better explained by any other uh, mental disorders. So, those are kind of common in all the disorders. So, it is very important to understand this, this uh, separation anxiety disorder is mostly experienced in the children when with the development they are not able to uh, kind of separate from the attachment figure like mother or father, uh, but it can occur to adults, but uh, the cases could be very less. So, that is something uh, very important about separation anxiety disorder. The last one is called selective mutism is another uh, anxiety disorder which was also included in the DSM-5. Uh, its symptoms are like consistent failure to speak in specific social situation in which there is an expectation of speaking. So, the person is selectively mute in a sense that the person is not able to speak in certain specific situation where he or she needs to speak, where there is a necessary or there is a need to speak, the person is not able to speak. Now, this failure to speak is not associated with some problem in the common language, it should not be or kind of uh, or it is not because of the person is not able to communicate that is not the case, but because of anxiety probably the person is not able to speak in a situation where he or she needs to speak, despite that person is able to speak in other situation. So, these are kind of, kind of some selective situations the person is not able to speak. The disturbance interferes with educational, occupational or achievement or with social communication. So, this could in influence or create disturbance or interferes in occupational life social communications and so on. So, the duration of this uh, disturbance should be at least for one month not limited to the first month of school. Obviously, when the pers a, chi a child goes to school first months probably the person will have difficulty in speaking and so on because of the fear or anxiety and so on. Uh, so, in th those cases are not included, but in general where they could speak in generally. Uh, at least for one month if they are not able to speak in certain selective cases which could not be explained because of lack or because of lack of communication or un inability to speak or th those cases are kind of not the case. In, in such situation uh, the selective mutism could be kind of uh, diagnosed, uh, it becomes a possible case. So, this failure to speak is not due to lack of knowledge, it is not that person uh, does not know how, what to say in that situation, it is not a failure of knowledge or comfort with the spoken language required. So, the person is also able to speak. So, the comfort issue is not there, 
lack of knowledge is also not there. So, the reason is mostly anxiety or certain situation provoke anxiety the person becomes uh, kind of not able to communicate or speak in those situation. And this disturbance is not is not better uh, kind of accounted for by a communication disorder. So, it is not a communication disorder hai, like stuttering and so on and does not occur exclusively during the course of pervasive development disorders like schizophrenia or other psychotic disorder. So, it is not explained by some other disorder. So, that is the thing. So, sometimes some people can become selectively mute. One possibility is because of the anxiety associated with certain situation and uh, it not is it is not because of the communication failure or not able to speak that is not the case person could speak in that language the person may have knowledge to speak but despite that not able to speak so selective mutism is typically diagnosed in child childhood and can have a significant impact on social mostly in childhood uh, these cases are uh, kind of reported so certain specific kind of therapies could be included in terms of uh, treating those disorders so, these are some uh, these are the categories that are listed under anxiety disorders. All these categories you will see the anxiety is the common thing which causes there is a distress in the person to the extent that the person is not able to function properly. Now, this distress could the source of this distress could be diverse things like specific objects or social situations or general life situations or it could be you know. Uh, whatever it is all these different cases that we have seen every disorder has different causes but the main the central aspect is that all these different aspects causes significant distress and the person is not able to function properly because of those distress uh, so let us see what are the possible causes of an anxiety disorders uh, if you look at the literature so one of the reason could be genetic predisposition of in, an individual vulnerability why some people have anxiety disorder in the first place one reason could be genetic reason so certain individuals are more susceptible or vulnerable to experiencing intense fear and anxiety than others some people experience more fear and anxiety as compared to others uh, simply because of there is a disposition is different some people are kind of biologically more reactive to situations of life so anxiety is more among them so, children who display excessive anxiety have higher likelihood of developing anxiety disorders. So, some people have excessive anxiety naturally in their system, they are more likely to develop anxiety disorders uh, later. When exposed to nearly identical traumatic experiences, some individuals develop anxiety disorder while others do not. So, many people we see a lot of individual differences. The same five people may be exposed to one event, but uh, the reaction of five individuals could be very different. Some may develop anxiety disorder after this, some may be just normal, some may uh, have other kind of uh, responses. So, why these individual differences happen? Obviously, the reasons, all the reasons are not very clear, but one reason could be genetic differences or genetic composition in terms of uh, the reactivity to situations are different because of the genetic, the differences in the genetic makeup. So, a lot of studies actually uh, shows that both panic disorder and phobias are prevalent among people with a family history of similar disorders, especially those with close relatives such as identical twins. So, a lot of studies actually shows panic disorders and phobias are kind of run in families. So, close relatives if they also have panic disorders or phobias, they are more likely to have other close mem family members are also likely to have more of these disorders, more likely to experience that does not mean they will have, they will experience, they are more likely to experience probably because of the genetic connection and genetic predisposition or vulnerability. Similarly, the identical twins also shows they experience uh, similar things, panic disorders if one twin have others will are so more, most likely to have similar disorder. So, that shows there could be a possible genetic connection towards this uh, disorder. One possible action how gene kind of creates these differences is through neurotransmitters. So, gene kind of stimulates different biological aspects in our system, different how different uh, how, you know, glands functions, how certain neurotransmitters are released. Uh, so, gene could influence all these things. In that sense, the gene could also influence your behavioral reaction and psychological aspects. One of the neurotransmitter means certain uh, chemicals that are released in the brain, neurotransmitter found in the amygdala region of the brain. Uh, which 
have been found to be connected with the anxiety disorder is serotonin, which has also been linked to depression also. It is also linked to depression and it is also linked to anxiety disorders. Uh, especially uh, this is released in the amygdala region of the brain where emotion is processed particularly the fear is processed. The previous research has suggested that the gene controlling the production of the serotonin, some genes the gene which is kind of associated with the production of serotonin transporter protein seems to be linked with uh, neuroticism and depression. So, neuroticism is related to anxiety, person with neuroticism experience high anxiety may play a role in anxiety disorders. So, this particular gene can which is connection with the production of serotonin transporter protein could be linked to anxiety disorder. So, several studies have found that individuals with the short form of this gene. So, this gene could there are different version of these genes present in different uh, humans. The so, short form is uh, more specifically seems to be connected to the anxiety disorder. Uh, uh, then the long forms the people who have short form of this gene seems to be more vulnerable for anxiety disorder as compared to the people who have long form of this gene which is responsible for the production of serotonin transporter protein. So, this could be one kind of possible gene that was found connected to the anxiety disorder. So, a lot of fMRI study also found that you know short form of gene showed uh, people with short form of this gene uh, showed stronger amygdala response when viewing photographs of uh, people express expressing anger and fear and so on. So, that means uh, they are more reactive to emotional cues. Another study found that individuals with the short form of gene uh, learned danger cues more quickly in a fear conditioning paradigm. So, they are more reactive to uh, dangers and those kind of emotional situation, uh, especially the people with this short form of this gene. So, it is possible alteration in serotonin activity led to an over responsive amygdala. Uh, which is uh, related to anxiety disorder. So, it is possible that uh, such genes especially this gene could be connected to anxiety disorder. However, not everyone with this gene develops disorder and some people without it also do. So, that means everything cannot be explained by gene. So, there can be other factors included or could be uh, responsible for anxiety disorder. So, gene could be one aspect, but in many cases without this, this gene also people have anxiety disorder. So, that means other factors could be contributing to it. Another factor that is uh, could be connected to uh, the anxiety disorder is traumatic events that happens in the past or personal experiences in life could also contribute to uh, anxiety disorders. Numerous individuals develop fears subsequent to certain events in their life particularly the traumatic events. For instance, children who have been sexually abused are on an average more likely to develop fear related disorders. So, your life experiences can play a very important role particularly if you have experienced traumatic events in life that could lead to future possibility of developing certain anxiety disorders because of the past events that you have experienced. The impact of this event could lead to a kind of development of uh, anxiety disorders in the future like the studies have found. Uh, the children who are sexually abused during the childhood are more likely to develop fear related disorders and depression in their later later in their life. A small number of uh, individual can link the beginning of their phobias to personal experience. Some people can link why they develop fear to specific objects. They could link to some personal events in their life uh, like uh, such as uh, one person who found a dead body in a lake and thereafter had a phobia of water. Say, just by looking at a dead body in a water, the person develop phobia for the water itself. So, that is possible some personal event uh, could be associated why they develop fear for something. But many individual actually may not identify any specific event caused by phobia where gene can play a role. The research discovered that the twins of those who had a phobia had a similar risk of developing phobia means twins may both similar reaction patterns. Hota hai. So, that means gene could play a role here also regardless of whether could recall a traumatic event or not. Okay. So, that similarity of phobia reactions uh, in the twins particularly the identical twins could also kind of indicate some genetic predisposition. So, this implies that traumatic experience does not raise the risk of developing a phobia beyond existing genetic factor. The idea is this traumatic events genetic factors they could kind of combine together and contribute to uh, the development of anxiety disorders. So, how 
anxiety disorders are treated mostly the cognitive therapies are used just like depression uh, where people kind of they try to kind of intervene at the thought processes uh, level where they try to change the thought patterns in order to cure the anxiety symptoms. So, cognitive therapy which has been effective in treating depression can also be used to treat generalized anxiety disorder particularly and some panic disorders also. So, in generalized anxiety disorder therapy may focus on identifying that the feelings of worry and the people may be slowly they they try, try to try to thought uh, or the therapies kind of teach them uh, and increase their tolerance for uncertainty they slowly slowly they learn to kind of tolerate uncertainties in life and not to become anxious for every uncertainties in their life and develop problem solving skills instead of just constantly worrying about what will happen if this happens and so on. For panic disorder treatment may involve reinterpreting physiological symptoms particularly if heartbeat starts becoming faster people may experience or think that panic is going to happen. So, they slowly slowly the therapies teach them how to kind of interpret the physiological symptoms then and every heartbeat rise does not mean panic uh, symptoms. So, slowly slowly they are trained to reinterpret those physiological symptoms to reduce their perceived threat and increase tolerance for some physiological symptoms which kind of they may interpret as sign of next panic attack. In case of phobias mostly people use exposure therapies so which are basically the person whatever is the object of fear the person is slowly slowly exposed to those objects but in a more controlled controlled way so that person learns to face them. So, specific phobias are often treated using exposure therapy which involves gradually exposing the individual to the object with which they are fearful. For example, a therapist may use exposure therapy to help someone with arachnophobia which is basically phobia for spider. So, if somebody is excessively afraid of uh, spiders they could use exposure therapy here. Uh, the therapy may begin with imagining a small spider several feet away and how do you experience this? So, become more tolerant to the spider imagining them or actually kind of looking at them from a distant and then gradually progressing to more realistic situations such as bringing in a small spider on the other side of the room and eventually working up being able to touch the spider. So, slowly slowly in a more controlled way the person is learned to face those objects in a more gradual manner so that their fear is uh, reduced and they are no longer afraid of those objects. So, that is called exposure therapy. So, this is generally done in a safe and controlled environment so that the person does not become overwhelmed and does not cause any harm. A research has shown generally exposure therapy are effective in treating specific phobias if people have fear for some specific objects uh, with many individual experiencing significant reduction in their fears and anxiety. Uh, people also sometimes use uh, the anxiety relief drugs uh, such as tranquilizers uh, specifially the only uh, no certified doctors and medical professions can give these drugs not just everybody can take it. So, like tranquilizers are used to reduce uh, anxiety uh, these are commonly used uh, and uh, it includes Valium and many other drugs which are typically taken orally as pills and can their impact could last for hours with varying duration especially if when the anxiety symptoms are very strong initially some tranquilizer could be helpful. So, this tranquilizer basically enhance the activity of neurotransmitter called GABA uh, which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter throughout the nervous system. By doing so tranquilizer reduce activity in the amygdala which decreases the response to emotion of fear and so on. So, this neurotransmitter it works on this neurotransmitter and reduce the activity in amygdala region of the brain which is responsible for most of the fear and emotion related reactions. So, uska activity it goes down. So, anxiety also goes down. However, this tranquilizer all these thing drugs may have side effects also. They may reduce the overall activity of the brain and cause drowsiness and impairment and other functions also could be there. So, generally a professional medical person can give it whenever it is really necessary and so on. So, these are some of the things about anxiety disorders. So, this was about emotion based disorder. In this mostly we have discussed two major disorders which are in terms of prevalence rate their numbers are very high in the population. Uh, uh, 
uh, in the global context. So, one is depression and one is anxiety disorders. So, we will not be talking about any other emotion based disorder because there are many disorders where emotion could be uh, at the center of it, but these are the two major disorders uh, that we have included in this module. So, we will be talking about emotion regulation in the next module, how to regulate emotions. So, with this I will stop here, thank you. Thank you.